morning, everyone. I didn't introduce myself before. My name is Evie Martin. I'm the lead pastor here at Platwood Church. It's good to be gathered together for worship in this space. A special welcome to those of you worshiping with us online today. Anyone see the new Beetlejuice movie this fall? Anyone? A few in the room? I haven't. Um, but its release did prompt me to go back and watch the original Beetlejuice movie just to catch up after a couple of decades. And for those of you worried that I'm going to say the name a third time, relax. (laughs) I won't. I don't want to make you superstitious types nervous, and I'll be honest, we don't need that that kind of Michael Keaton energy wreaking havoc on us today. So we're just going to play it safe. Not going to say it. But if there's one thing that people remember from that movie, it's that gimmick that uttering his name three times will conjure up all the dark and gruesome tricks and powers of the spirit realm he occupies. The power is in the name. Names other than that one have power too. Names convey meaning. Names identify heritage, position, personality. Names are how we are known, and names are how we know and experience others. In the church and beyond, throughout history, The name of Jesus has meant a great deal to a great many people. It is, as we sing in several songs throughout our tradition, the name above all names. And so this series has been designed to help us listen once again to the name of Jesus, what he is called in the Gospels, how he is known to his followers, and how we can better know him even still today. We have leaned into and recentered ourselves around Jesus as Christ, the one in whom all things flow, from whom all things flow. Jesus as Lord, the owner of our hearts. Jesus as Word, the one who speaks and creates. And we'll finish today with Jesus as King. Not a lot of us grew up in countries with kings. Maybe a handful of you did. Most of us couldn't even name a modern day king. Well, maybe this one. Here's some other ones. Tell me if you recognize any of them. I don't, I don't know. Kings, there you go. For the majority of us who grew up in the United States, a nation founded and built on the determination that it would never be governed by a singular leader with absolute authority, these are the kings with which we are most familiar. Not these, these, these are the kings. <laughs> But truly, for any self-respecting American of a certain age, when asked who is the king, there is only one true answer. (laughs) All that to say, the name king for Jesus might be the most problematic one for us because it is the least connected to our real lives today. On the other hand, maybe that works to our advantage because Jesus wasn't a king like any other king. But before we talk about Jesus as king, we need to step farther back into the story of God. If we trace the arc of our Old Testament story, we remember that the Hebrew people were nomadic for the earliest part of their history. They didn't have a land, they moved from place to place, and the presence of God dwelt among them in a tent that they would pack up and move with them every time they migrated. That is, of course, until they became enslaved under Pharaoh in Egypt. This was their first real experience living under a human structure of power, and it wasn't pleasant. They were impoverished. They were overworked. They had little to no human dignity. And when their population would grow too much, the Pharaoh, the king, would thin it out, starting with the babies. The Hebrew people, the people of God, had their taste of what power and kingship in an empire looked like for 400 years. And then, of course, comes the defining story of the Old Testament. Moses leads the Israelites in their exodus from Egypt. The enslaved walk to their freedom through the Red Sea. God brings them out of Egypt and in time into the promised land to be the people God intended them to be, a people set apart to show the world who God is. And a major piece of what it meant for them to be set apart was that they had no king. God did not intend for them to have a king. God was to be their king. 
And that alone would make them unlike any other people in the world. They would live together bound by the law God had given them. And so they did. For the first many generations, God appointed judges among them to interpret the law and settle disputes. You can read all about those judges, people like Joshua and Deborah, Gideon, Samson, in the book conveniently called Judges. But then we get to Samuel, and he's the last judge. The people have apparently had enough of this God as king experiment. No one really says why, other than the main reason people say anything. Everybody else is doing it. We want a king too. Here's how things unfold in 1 Samuel chapter 8. So all the Israelite elders got together and went to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, listen, you're old now. Your sons don't follow in your footsteps, so appoint us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. It seemed very bad to Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. So he prayed to the Lord. The Lord answered Samuel, comply with the people's request, everything they ask of you, because they haven't rejected you. No, they've rejected me as king over them. They are doing to you only what they've been doing to me from the day I brought them out of Egypt to this very minute, abandoning me and worshiping other gods. So comply with their request. But give them a clear warning, telling them how the king will rule over them and operate. So Samuel does. He describes for the people just exactly what it will be like to have a human king. It seems that memory of Egypt is too distant now. He describes how a king will put them to work and then tax them. A king will make them his military and send them off to war. A king will take their children to work for him, take their fields and the crops they grow. He will feed his own servants with the food from their fields. A king will build an economy, an empire, which will then have to feed itself, and he will use them to feed it. Samuel tells them that when all this happens, they will regret it and cry out and complain to the Lord again. And then they respond in verse 19. No, there must be a king over us so we can be like all the other nations. Our king will judge us and lead us and fight our battles. Samuel listened to everything that people said and repeated it directly to the Lord. Then the Lord said to Samuel, comply with their request. Give them a king. And so we see the next chapter of Israel's history conveniently chronicled in the books of 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles. As a long litany of all the kings that came and went, some have longer stories than others, but at a basic level, the Bible consistently summarizes whether they were a good king or a bad king. A good king stayed close to the heart of God and ruled with the people in mind. King David was the best of the best. A bad king strayed from the law of God and ruled with himself in mind. Ahab was the worst of the worst. Here's a freebie in case this ever comes up at a trivia night in a Bible category. There were more bad kings than good ones. Shocking, I know. But God made provision, even for the bad ones, because God sent prophets We'll do a whole series on prophets, probably sometime next year, but in a nutshell, the prophet's purpose was to be a thorn in the side of the king, a voice willing to speak God's truth to the power that had gone to the king's head. Their purpose was to remind the king of God's desire for the people, that the poor would be cared for, that the immigrant would be treated as guest, that the women would still flourish in a world dominated by men. I don't think I need to spell out for you that prophets were not popular people. More often than not, they found themselves at odds with the king. Their truth-telling frequently failed to change hearts when it was up against the seduction of unmitigated power. And the life expectancy of a prophet was not long. But their purpose and their passion was to try to call out goodness from a king to give them every opportunity to be the kind of king the people needed, the kind of king God desired, to be a good king. And yet so many kings chose another way. Isn't that the baseline question for kings? Isn't that what people want to know? Will he be a good king or will he be a bad king? 
What kind of king is he going to be? And then through the lens of history, we look back asking, what kind of king was he? This is the very same question we should start with when we approach Jesus with his name of king. What kind of king was he? The short answer is, he was very disappointing to most people from the beginning. Just think about where kings are born, even the Disney ones with which we're most familiar. If you're looking for a baby king, where do you look? You expect him to be born in the palace. We'll see this same expectation play out for Jesus in just a few weeks when the magi, the mysterious kings from afar, go looking for one like them. They end up at Herod's palace in the big city. That's where a new king would be born, obviously. And yet, where do they find Jesus? Born into a poor family, in a crowded room, in a backwoods town, to a powerless people under the thumb of yet another empire. He was not what they expected. He wasn't what anyone who longed to be liberated and released from the crush of Rome expected. Jesus comes onto the scene in an extremely complex and volatile political moment in human history. He grew up watching failed attempts at revolution, Seeing groups who tried to stand up to the empire be mercilessly crushed, he likely saw friends or even family die for engaging the political machine. He knew firsthand the consequences of speaking up when your voice doesn't matter. And he did it anyway. He challenged the status quo. He pushed against the interpretation of the law. He would not pledge his allegiance to the emperor, nor would he play the legal games of the religious experts. He stood firm against the power that would eventually kill him. He stood against the power of the empire, but he did not seek it for himself, nor does he ever tell his followers to take it. Instead, he rejects it. Jesus had no interest in being king over the kingdom he had stepped into. He lived within it. He knew that those of us who would follow him would always live in the kingdom in some way, shape, or form. Instead, he invited those who chose to follow him into a different kingdom. Not the chief's kingdom, the kingdom of God. Was there anyone left who would be content for God alone in Christ to be their king? His final week in the empire has him riding into Jerusalem to the celebration and the eager hopes of the masses, his triumphal entry, as it is called, but he does not ride in on a horse like the kings who are ready for war and conquest. That's what many had hoped for. He rides in on a donkey, a noble but humble animal meant for service and for peace. From start to finish, Jesus as king is not what people were looking for. What kind of king will he be? They must have asked at his birth. And at the end, they must have thought he wasn't much of a king at all. Jesus is a peculiar king, and his is a peculiar kingdom. He makes no apologies for either truth. Because his purpose as king was not to be the kind of king that had failed the world so many times. His purpose was not to conform to a kingly role, but to transform it. Just as God never intended for God's people to have a king, God never intended for Jesus to be the kind of king they thought they needed. In John chapter 18, we see Jesus before Pilate in a conversation about just what kind of king he was. Much like the name Lord, which we talked about a few weeks ago, here we find other people putting a title of worldly power onto Jesus. He doesn't openly accept it, but he does say, if you're going to call me that, here's what it really means. In these rushed hours of Jesus' middle-of-the-night trial, the day before his crucifixion, here's what Jesus has to say about kings and kingdoms. Pilate went back into the palace. He summoned Jesus and asked, Are you the king of the Jews? 
Jesus answered, do you say this on your own or have others spoken to you about me? Pilate responded, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your nation and its chief priest handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus replied, my kingdom doesn't originate from this world. If it did, my guards would fight so that I wouldn't have been arrested by the Jewish leaders. My kingdom isn't from here. So you are a king, Pilate said. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. I was born and came into the world for this reason, to testify to the truth. Whoever accepts the truth listens to my voice. What is truth? Pilate asked. Jesus doesn't deny the title of king here, but he also doesn't grab it as his identity. You say that I'm king, he says. Fine, but I'm not reaching for the kind of power you have. The people who want to call me king will hear a different story. They'll change the world by different means than you do. Every king has a kingdom, and Jesus draws this connection, but is quick to say that his kingdom is of a different kind. He has been busy telling his disciples and anyone who will listen for many, many months what his kingdom is like. In Matthew chapter 13, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and planted in his field. It's the smallest of all seeds. But when it's grown, it's the largest of all vegetable plants. It becomes a tree so that the birds in the sky come and nest in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast, which a woman took and hid in a bushel of wheat flour until the yeast had worked its way all through the dough. Jesus' kingdom does not overthrow worldly powers. It does not seek to inhabit national thrones. Instead, its citizens work like microscopic seeds and organisms changing their hosts from the inside out, moving through the dough and the soil to bring about God's patient, persistent, eternal vision for the world. 99 years ago, the world had seen the end of World War I, the bloodshed and death toll leaving its mark on Europe, but the lens of history tells us clearly that the threat of worldly kings and their reigns was far from over. Fascism was on the rise in Europe and setting the stage for another war just decades away. The Catholic Church, led at the time by Pope Pius XI, bore witness to this ruin and the alarming blind allegiance to those leaders who would claim authority. And so Pope Pius instituted a new feast day in 1925 called the Feast of Christ the King. The intent of this day was to remind Christians in the rhythm of every year that their allegiance was to their spiritual ruler in heaven, as opposed to earthly supremacy, which was claimed at that time by Benito Mussolini. It was the same year that Adolf Hitler published Mein Kampf, and we know where things went from there. Christ the King Sunday began as a challenge to the church to refocus its energies on their true ruler and away from unquestioning fidelity to earthly powers. Who is the king? Christ is the king. And he's a king like no other king we've ever known. Christ the King Sunday is today. 99 years later, we, the church, still need a crystal clear reminder of whose kingdom it is that, to which we belong, of whose authority guides our lives, of whose policies govern our actions. And if and when we forget, Jesus himself reminds us beyond a shadow of a doubt, Jesus doesn't wear a crown. You may see him with a crown in art and images of Christ the King, but the only crown that ever rested on his head was made of thorns. He never claims the title of king for himself with one exception. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus foreshadows what it will be like at the end. The end of time, the end of us, the end of the kingdoms of this world, and it is in this future tense that he finally refers to himself as king. It's the only time he does so. 
He describes the nations gathering before his throne where he divides them into two groups. Then the king will say to those on his right, he says, come, you who will receive good things from my father, inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you before the world began. I was hungry and you gave me food to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a migrant and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothes to wear. I was sick, you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then those who are righteous will reply to him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or, or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you as a migrant and welcome you or naked and give you clothes to wear? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? Then the king will reply to them, I assure you that when you have done it for one of the least important of these brothers and sisters of mine, you've done it for me. You can probably guess what he said to the group on the other side, even if you've never read this passage. They were the folks who did the opposite. They saw the hungry, the thirsty, the migrant, the naked, the sick, the prisoner, and did nothing. Or we might even imagine persecuted, deported, denied, abused, took away their rights. His meaning, the king was right in front of them and they could not see it was him. We really love it when Jesus is compassionate and inspiring and performing miracles and blessing babies. That's the Jesus we want to hang out with. But there's another Jesus here in this story. It's King Jesus, remember? And he is very clear on the expectations for the citizens of his kingdom. He's also very clear on the consequences for saying he's our king and failing to live by the law of his kingdom. In his words, then the king will say to those on his left, get away from me. You who will receive terrible things, go into the unending fire that has been prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry, and you didn't give me food to eat. I was thirsty, and you didn't give me anything to drink. I was a migrant, and you didn't welcome me. I was naked, and you didn't give me clothes to wear. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. Whatever kind of king people thought Jesus was going to be, whatever image of king we try to layer onto him today, this is the king that he was. He is a king who turns the title on its head, a king whose favor has nothing to do with anything we think or believe or argue about. In his foreshadowing here of the final judgment, he isn't asking the people, the nations, us, how often we go to church, if we believe the Apostles' Creed, what our theology of salvation is, if we have an opinion on how to take care of the poor, how many mistakes we've made, how we voted. He doesn't ask any of that. The criteria for where his favor falls is simply and profoundly did you see the least important around you and act on their behalf, or did you not? That's it. Did you, or did you not? Do you, or do you not? When we give Jesus the name King, it turns out it really means very little at all about him. He was mostly disinterested in the title. It means everything for us. It is a name that if we are to use it, demands so much more than adoration and praise. It demands our action. It demands our eyes to see the king all around us in the least important people. The ones we'd rather not look at. The ones whose voices are inconvenient for us to hear. The ones who are hungry. The ones who we are told are not worth our time and attention. The ones who are diminished by those in power. The ones who are wrongfully accused and sentenced. The ones who are born in a feeding trough for animals. A manger in a backwoods town that no one cares about. 
Christ the King Sunday is today. It's the final Sunday every year, right before the season of Advent begins. Next week, we turn our eyes and our hearts toward the expectation of Christmas. Our hearts, our worship, our longing is tuned for the coming of Christ as he came once in the flesh to dwell with us and as he will come again one day to his kingdom as he has called it to be. What kind of king will we be looking for? Will we recognize him when he appears all around us? Will our hearts know what we are to do? May our eyes be open to see the king. Will you pray with me? Most gracious God, who in Jesus of Nazareth showed us an alternative to the kings, queens, and emperors of history, help us as citizens of his kingdom to love and to seek justice for all people. Help us to recognize the true life-changing power based in loving you and all of our neighbors. In Christ Jesus, with you and the Holy Spirit, may we work toward a world ruled not through domination, but in your radical and all-powerful compassion and love. Amen.